Why OpenID Connect is more secure than certificates. My name is Bart Borstein. I'm the CTO at Tremble Security. All right, why certificates? They're the strongest credential out there when done correctly. Example, US federal government uses them for their strongest um, transactions. Uh, a lot of industries use them built into smart cards outside of the US federal government. When done correctly, it is a great credential. Done correctly is the important part. We're gonna get into that in the next set of, of slides. It's built directly into Kubernetes. Chances are the first time you used uh, authentication with Kubernetes was with a certificate. You deployed kubeadm, got your admin.com file, and you were off to the races. So let's talk about what makes a certificate secure. Where does that security come from? You got three actors here. You got key store hardware security module, and just about everything these days has a hardware security module. Whether you're talking about a mobile phone or a server, it could be on a smart card or a YubiKey. Um, and so that's where you're going to keep your your key and your certificate. You got certificate authority. That's where the trust comes from. And you got a web server. Web server trusts the certificate authority. The certificate authority trusts you. So on, side, on your device, you generate your key pair and you generate a certificate signing request. The certificate signing request is then sent to the certificate authority, not your private key, just your certificate signing request. That contains a public key as well as some additional metadata information for your CA. CA says, yep, we're gonna sign it, signs it with its private key, sends back a, that certificate. You then ins install that directly into your key store or hardware security module. You're going to go interact with an application like the API server. You're going to establish a connection, exchange certificates. At this point, the web server is going to tell you, hey, here are all the issuers that I'm going to trust. Give me a cert from one of these issuers. You present the cert. The web server is going to check a couple of things, including whether or not it's on a certificate revocation list. Identity certificates can be very long lived. For instance, those PIV cards, the certificates used by the US federal government often have lives of five years because they want to keep replacing those cards. Uh, and so if somebody's contract ends, they retire, they leave their agency, their company, whatnot, for whatever reason that certificate is no longer valid, guess what? By dates, it's still valid. So if you want to make sure that nobody uses it anymore, you need to add it to something called a certificate revocation list. You gotta say this certificate has been revoked. That's how the web server knows, hey, even though the cert is still technically valid from a cryptographic standpoint, it should no longer be trusted. That all checks out, all the trust is validated, your handshake is established, you do secure stuff. At no point did your private key leave the HSM, and that's where the security of this comes in. The private key, the thing that makes this so secure, never left your HSM which means in order to get access to it, they need to have physical, an attacker would need to have physical access to the HSM. So why wouldn't you use certificates? Well, for one, uh, there is no HSM support in Kube Control right now. Uh, PKCS11, which is the protocol that's used to talk to hardware security modules, is not right now supported by Kube Control. Um, that is changing. Uh, there is an open cap and somebody's being paid to build it. So I'm pretty confident that I'll make it in there in the not too distant future. Uh, now, even if you have that hardware security support, there is no CRL support in the API server. So even if you have access to that hardware certificate, that's really, really strong certificate that you're using to identify users, you can't make sure that that certificate should still be trusted. Uh, there is an open issue for it. It hasn't really made a lot of progress. It also was called out as part of the Kubernetes security audit from a couple of years ago. Uh, this all assumes that you're deploying your certificates correctly. And quite frankly, that's probably not the case. Um, I don't mean to call anybody's baby ugly, but if you're downloading your key pair, if somebody's giving you a conf file, uh, you're not doing it right. Uh, and so you're losing a lot of the security benefit there. Group management is really, really hard. Why are groups? You can do groups in a certificate. Uh, you can do it as an OU in the subject of the cert, but there are two problems with it. One, you can't revoke the cert. So if your groups change, the cert can't be revoked. Two, um, you don't want to say, okay, well, we're going to do it all with RBAC. 
Uh, you know, if you have five or 10 developers doing with the RBAC, probably not that big of a deal listing each one in a, a role binding. Uh, you have 50, 100, 1,000 developers in a large enterprise, it's going to get messy really, really fast. Um, you want to be able to do groups. And it won't work with the managed cluster. So if you're using uh, EKS, GK, whatever, certificates aren't even an option, not right out of the box. Uh, and they won't work the reverse proxy. If you want your API server to validate a certificate directly, guess what? None of that network infrastructure that you have for TLS offloading is going to work. You need to have that direct connection. Now, there is kind of an exception to that. We'll get to that at the end. So what makes OpenID Connect so great? It's a ratified standard. Well, set of standards. There's like 30 or 40 of them, I think, that make it up. Um, it supports multiple MFA options because it's reliant upon a web browser when done correctly. Uh, if you are putting your username and password into a CLI, you're not doing it correctly. Um, that web browser opens up infinite numbers of MFA options, where you're talking about something like Duo or Okta. I'm a big fan of U2F, which is the FIDO uh, standard using hardware keys. Lots of possibilities there. Uh, it'll work with both on-prem and managed clouds. You can use impersonation with OpenID Connect, and it'll work with any cloud. So you can have the authenticate the same way to your on-prem stuff as your off-prem stuff. Uh, and short-lived tokens. So you don't have these five-year certificates. You have these one-minute tokens. And we'll talk about how that works. And finally, groups are easy because those tokens are short-lived. It's just a bit of JSON that's digitally signed. You can shove all your groups right in there. All right, so how does OpenID Connect work? First thing you do is you authenticate to your identity provider. This part is completely non-standard. This is dependent entirely on your client and your identity provider. Uh, Open Unison has a couple of really nifty ways to automate this without having to deploy anything additional. Uh, but there are apps out there to work with both Keycloak and Dex if you want to go that route. Identity provider is going to give you two tokens, an ID token and a refresh token. The ID token gets you into the party. The refresh token gets you a new ticket when the time comes. If the ID token is still good, when you make a request to the API server, you're just going to put that ID token right into the request. This is what's called a bearer token. This is a security issue. Um, because you don't need anything else with it, if somebody compromises that token, they can use it against your API server, which is why it's so important to have a short-lived token. Once you're authenticated, you can do your secure stuff. Uh, finally, has the ID token expired? It's been a minute, you need a new token. So now you authenticate, but with the refresh token. So this all happens with kube control behind the scenes. That refresh token is one-time use. Once it's used, it's burned. You can't use it again. You get a new refresh token, a new ID token, Rinse and repeat until you're done doing your work for the day. So OIDC is perfect, right? Not really. Like I said, bearer token, easily abused. There's always a string, uh, a history of leakage uh, vulnerabilities. One just came out with VMware, I think. Um, so uh, it's really important to have those short-lived tokens. It can be difficult to implement a lot of different steps, different projects in there, whereas with certificates, it's a direct connection. Uh, so that can make it harder to implement and harder to, be, to debug. But what about using vault copy certs and all sorts of other schemes that I've seen? Um, ultimately, you're re-implementing OpenID Connect's refresh process, but without the thousands of hours of peer review that OpenID has gotten. Chances are, unless you work at one of the larger cloud vendors, you're not going to have enough eyes on whatever you develop to equal the amount of time that's been put into OpenID Connect. I really want certs. Great, use certs with OpenID Connect. Have your identity provider authenticate with the certificate, check your CRL, you're off to the races. That doesn't work for you. Use a reverse proxy with impersonation. Your reverse proxy checks the cert, checks the CRL, uses impersonation with the API server, works in both cloud and, and on-prem solutions. Hey, thanks very much for taking the time to learn about certificates. You can find me on the Twitters at MLBIM. And if you're looking for an OpenID Connect identity provider for your uh, Kubernetes deployment, take a look at OpenUnison. It's our open source project. OpenID Connect, SAML, LDAP, 
the works. Multi-factor, all there. Thanks and enjoy KubeCon.